In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Creator ineffable, who of the riches of thy wisdom didst appoint three hierarchies of angels, and didst set them in wondrous order of the highest heavens, and didst apportion elements of the world most wisely. Do thou, who art in truth the fountain of light and wisdom, deign to shed upon the darkness of my understanding the rays of thine infinite brightness, and to remove far from me the twofold darkness in which I was born, namely sin and ignorance. Do thou, who givest speech to the tongues of little children, instruct my tongue and pour into my lips the grace of thy benediction. Give me keenness of apprehension, capacity for remembering, method and ease in learning, insight and interpretation, and copious eloquence in speech. Instruct my beginning, direct my progress, and set thy seal upon the finished work. Thou who art true God and true man, who livest and reignest, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, so um, the title of my talk is Ed The Educational Philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, so I'm showing a picture here from the Flemish painter Octavio von Keen. In 1610, he painted many scenes of the life of, of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, this particular scene here, let me zoom in so you can see it a little better. Um, it shows uh, different popes that had, um, I think it says Gregory the 10th or 11th, I can't quite read that, um, but it says, quote, articulus tot miracula, so as many articles that he wrote, um, as many miracles he performed. In other words, every article of his famous work, Summa Theologica, was considered a miracle, um, just by the clarity of its exposition and uh, the arguments that it presented in, in very logical, syllogistic form. Um, so this painting shows him with like a heart of the sun <laughs> and the Holy Ghost speaking into his ear, um, it, uh, really giving him divine illumination. Um, so the other picture I have over here is the cover of a book by uh, Father Gooley. He wrote a book in 1965, which is actually the published form of his PhD dissertation, called The Educational Philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. This is probably one of the best educational philosophy books that I've ever read. Um, he starts out talking about the difference between Plato and Aristotle, um, you know, the philosophers, famous Greek philosophers before Christ. Plato was Aristotle's teacher. Um, and Plato was a student of Socrates. And Plato and Aristotle had radically different educational philosophies. Plato thought that knowledge pre-existed in the mind. So you were born knowing everything, and that the role of the teacher was merely to help the student recall what he already was born with, what he already knew. Um, Aristotle is the complete opposite. He thought that we start out as blank slates, tabula rasa, is the the Latin form of it. Um, and we start out just like a blank slate and all our sensory information will put information, put data onto that slate, onto our intellect. So we, we start out really not knowing anything. Um, and through our senses, we, we gain and build more knowledge. Um, that was Aristotle's view. Um, and St. Thomas Aquinas will be more Aristotelian than Platonic, um, and we'll talk more about how he thinks we actually learn. Um, but it was um, an important book for me because it showed that um, the actual role is threefold. There's the student, the teacher, and Christ himself illuminating the intellect. So it's not um, the student produces some uh, you know, it has to, you know, students not purely passive in the learning process, okay? Although, you know, it might seem like that with Aristotle's view that we're just a blank slate. A slate, is, you know, you just write on. The slate doesn't really do much <laughs> for, for you writing on it. It just offers, you know, it just receives what you put on it. Um, but it's actually, the student's role is actually more than that. Um, and the teacher is not the, the sole, what's called efficient cause, of the student's knowledge. Um, the teacher works as an instrument um, with God 
and the student in order to produce learning in the student. Um, and that, that was all explained very well in, in Father Goli's work. Okay. So just to mention a little bit about St. Thomas Aquinas, he was born in 1225, so at the beginning of the 13th century. Um, so about a little, you know, a little over a decade after the St. Dominic founded the Dominican Order, um, so the, the Dominican Order, actually their nuns, their teaching sisters, started out first in Pruil in France in 1206. Um, St. Dominic died in 1221. Um, so St. Thomas was born just a little bit after St. Dominic's death. Um, he would eventually enter the Dominican Order when he was a teenager, roughly 17 years old, I think he was, when he decided to take the Dominican habit of this newly formed religious order. His um, parents, his mother, and his brothers didn't like that, um, and they eventually locked him up in a tower for a couple of years um, and tried to dissuade him by his, from his vocation by um, bringing in a courtesan, and he chased her out with a, a fiery brand. And this picture here shows him being girded miraculously by two angels. So he's, he's wrapped with this cord that protects his, his chastity and also gives him this um, great in angelic intelligence. Okay? Um, so angels are pure intellects. They're much more intelligent than we are. Um, but um, St. Thomas, even though <laughs> he was a human being, he had this intellect very similar to an angel. Um, so that's why he's called the angelic doctor. Okay. And also, this episode, you know, he was a teenager, so it emphasizes the importance of, of chastity and purity <laughs> in scholars. Um, you know, the, the more pure the body is, the, the better um, it is able to, to study and, and to learn. Okay. He's also called the common doctor, um, not because he's just average, but because he um, really summarized all of theology and, and philosophy, all of Christian philosophy as well, before him. Um, so during that time, he was imprisoned in the, in the tower. Uh, he only had a couple books. I think it was the book of Aristotle and then the Bible. Um, so he used that time of his imprisonment to really uh, study the, the pagan philosopher Aristotle. Now, there's a lot in Aristotle that's not compatible with the Catholic faith, um, so that's why St. Thomas is said to have baptized Aristotle in a way because he's, he kind of he takes what's good, and, and this is a good lesson for all scholars. He takes what's good in what anybody says, and he keeps that. You know, he if, he doesn't, doesn't really care who the source is as long as you know, they are saying what's true. He has this real love of, of the truth. So he commentated on and, and read works by like Maimonides, who was a famous Jewish theologian um, who pioneered the, the idea of negative theology, that we can only know what God is not, not and we can't really know positively what he is because our intellects are, are so weak um, in, in the light of this infinite being. Um, uh, he read also um, Averroes, who was a um, Muslim philosopher, uh, so Aristotle, you know, he was familiar with um, many of the church fathers. Um, the biggest influence, the, the most prominent church father that influenced him was St. Augustine. Um, so St. Augustine is cited in his work, in St. Thomas's works, you know, about 20% of his citations are to St. Augustine. So, it, um, and then he wrote this work called the Summa Theologiae, sometimes it's called the Summa Theologica, um, but basically it means the, the summit or the summary of all of theology. Okay, so this is a, a work, it has thousands of what are called articles and questions. So he, he has certain questions and then um, within each question he um, distinguishes different articles and he, he um, presents objections and answers those objections in what's called um, scholastic format. It was a way of, of teaching you know, you'd pose a question, you would present uh, several objections to the question, then you would have what's called the said contra, which is usually some um, 
evidence by authority against the position that you're that you're defending and then he, he gives his own response and then after that he answers the objections that were presented first this is a common um, teaching technique that was used in the the medieval universities okay. um, so why st. Thomas Aquinas why why the angelic doctor um, why should we care about what somebody in the 13th century <laughs> wrote right well every pope since his time so he died in in 1274 so just short of 50 years old um, which is interesting because Aristotle said that you have to really turn you have to be at least 50 years old in order to be truly a wise man but so St. Thomas Aquinas um, you know, by that sort of angelic intellect he had was able to become a wise man even before 50 years old it's an interesting tidbit um, so Alexander the fourth he reigned until 1261 he was the first pope to recommend the the thought of st. Thomas Aquinas then now it wasn't really until far after his death actually until st. Robert Bellarmine's time um, so that's like 16th century that st. Thomas was really that, that his works were really used um, basically in all Catholic universities um, there's a, a lot of resistance um, initially to his ideas although even early on in the 13 in the early 1300s um, like Pope John the 22nd here um, understood that his doctrine um, was very important to for the church um, Pope John the the 22nd canonized um, st. Thomas Aquinas on July 18th 1323 so just yesterday 700 years ago from yesterday <laughs> is the anniversary of his canonization um, John the 22nd said he has illuminated the church more than all the other doctors to read his books for a year profits a man more than to study the doctrine of others for his whole life okay um, and that's because he was able to synthesize all the thought and work um, of the great theologians and philosophers that that preceded him and put it in a very digestible presentable form um, the interesting thing about the Summa Theologica work um, at the very beginning of it is st. Thomas says that it was intended for beginners okay so this work that is you know basically all theology that has come since then is, is basically footnotes to the Summa Theologiae um, so this greatest theological work um, was St. Thomas intended just to be for beginners in theology. Um, uh, so it was, it was certainly used in universities um, all the way up until 1960s um, as a, an introductory work. And, and even there's some universities that still use it even today. It's not so common to find a Thomistic Institute. There's actually one in... Um, University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas has a very good um, Thomistic Studies program. Um, but this work, um, it, it's presented in, in just such uh, the, the way that he ordered the questions. He starts out um, by talking about you know what, what's called sacred doctrine, sacra doctrina. So it's divided up into, into three parts. The first part begins with talking about what sa sacred doctrine is, and then he goes into... Um, addressing you know, how can we know God does God exist you know his famous proofs of God's existence um, come at the very beginning of, of this work um, so the second and then there's um, second part which is split up into two two parts where he discusses things like um, virtue and morality it's more about man okay and then the last part has to do with um, salvation the sacraments now, how how God returns back to man. So he divides the work starting with God, and then the next third of the work is about man, and then in the last third is about how man can come back to God. So he forms this this whole loop. Um, it's called the regressus and egressus. You know, it comes from God and then back to God. Um, so, anyways, this work St. Thomas was able to present theology in such a. I mean, this is why. Um, 
Pope Leo XIII appointed him universal patron of Catholic schools and Catholic teachers um, because he had this incredible skill of presenting, you know, the way in which he presented um, um, the arguments and addressed the questions um, um, was just a very pedagogically sound method. Okay. So even all the way up into the present time, so I've um, listed Pope Leo the Thirteenth in 1880, but you know all the way up to um, the present time, every pope has has recommended him, and I've got a couple more examples. Um, pope Saint Pius the Tenth said that the principles of philosophy laid down by Saint Thomas Aquinas are to be religiously and inviolably observed. Okay. So these principles, so we're not just to imitate St. Thomas as a great scholar, as a great teacher, um, but we're also to adopt his very principles, so the very starting places that he, um, that he starts with. And another aspect of his pedagogy that's, that's really interesting is that he does not um, leave any leaf unturned. Um, he, he makes sure, he starts with very basic things, like in his proof of God's existence, he starts with the basic fact that we know by our senses that things change. Okay, this is something even fifth graders can understand, right? We experience change all the time, right? So he starts with this very simple things and makes sure that, it makes sure that those principles are um, are established first before he builds this great theological structure um, that that he builds in in the Summa Theologica. Um, so he, you know, you know, your conclusions are only going to be as good as your your principles are. If you have a there's a scholastic axiom that if you have a small error in principles, you have a big error in conclusions. You know, if you get your starting place starting point off, you know, if you or another analogy is if you are building on sand, right, you're not going to be able to build a very tall, tall structure. So the foundation has to be granite, solid foundation. So these are the, the principles that um, St. Thomas um, gives us, okay? And we're to build upon these. We're not to come up with our own principles and, and try to you know, <laughs> reinvent the wheel. Um, St. Thomas has, has given us the starting plate points, um, and he doesn't. He knows, and he admits that he doesn't know the answers to everything. For example, with the question of the Immaculate Conception, he really struggled understanding that. Um, so he knows that there are still open questions in theology. Um, he, he doesn't uh, <laughs> try to say that he's he's addressed everything and that there's nothing left to learn. No, these. Uh, that's why he said that his his work was is a book for beginners because it gives all the principles that beginners can start with and then build um, to advance their, their knowledge. Pope Pius XI, he instructs us not only by his example um, how to pursue such a diversity of studies. So he, he studied um, under St. Albert the Great who um, was a, a great polymath. Um, he had uh, biology, chemistry, um, all kinds of experiments going on in his uh, in Cologne, Germany, um, where Saint Thomas studied with him. Um, so he was from and mathematics uh, was very well versed in. Um, so Saint Thomas had a very wide knowledge. He had this uh, very um, ample intellect. Okay. He not only instructs us how to pursue a diversity of studies but also teaches us the firm and enduring principles of each single science. Okay. So St. Thomas commentated upon the, the scientific works of Aristotle, um, you know, purely philosophical works. Um, and St. Thomas didn't write just theology. These, these um, philosophical and scientific works were meant as instruments in, um, in order to help him do theology better. Um, and so he gives us these firm and enduring principles of mathematics, of, of physics, of, um, of metaphysics. Um, okay. And these principles were uh, synthesized in 1923 by the Sacred Congregation of Studies. So this is the congregation that overlooks 
you know, what the university curriculums were and um, and you know what's to be taught to to priests and to um, professors of theology and questions like that. So they came up with these 24 principles that all Catholic schools are to abide by, um, and you know, and I, I'm not going to go over all of them, but they're split up into three or into four categories here. Let me zoom on on this. First seven talk about ontology, which is um, beings. Okay, so the first one says potency and act so divide beings that whatsoever exists is either pure act who is God, or is composed of potency and actuality. Um, so this has to do with with beings. The next, so um, theses 8 through 12 have to do with cosmology, or we would say um, maybe physics today, or natural, natural sciences. Okay, these are the, the principles that um, that that we have to <laughs> that we cannot contradict if we are um, to do good natural philosophy. Okay, so it talks about what matter is. Um, you know what um, corporeal beings are. You know things that have length, breadth, and width, right? Like quantitative being. Um, um, physics is also a part of cosmology. So physics studies beings that change. You know how how change um, exists. You know, you know how things change. How do we explain change? Uh, okay. Um, what place is, you know, what it means to be in a certain place. Okay, so that's all studied under cosmology. The next part that's particularly interesting for um, pedagogy um, and for curriculum design and, and, you know, how Catholic teachers are to teach is psychology. So psyche is, means soul, right? but it, it's also, it's more than just our behaviors or um, but it studies our intellect and how we know um, and I've highlighted in or I've made bold here some particularly important points um, to teaching is that the intellect is a faculty intrinsically independent of any organ okay so the intellect you know, our, our human souls are, are one um, they're comprised of an intellect and a will right the, the intellect is something immaterial okay that our brain is not our intellect okay our brain is an instrument or, or is a, a sensory organ that provides our intellect with with data um, about the world around us okay but it's not the same as our intellect okay and we see this a lot um, in the philosophy of mind where people tend to think that neurological states are the same as thoughts um, you know the intellect and it is um, dependent upon the the sensory organs like the brain and, and our five um, external senses. Okay. Thesis, a, thesis 18 says intellectuality necessarily follows immateriality. Okay, so something that is more intellectual or more, I guess we could say, understandable um, is actually um, less material. So for example, if you are holding a rock, you know, if a student's holding a rock in his hands, you know, he's holding a particular rock. Um, but how does he really know what a rock is? What what this nature of rockness is? You know, what is what is rockness? Well, rockness is not this particular rock, right? Rockness is something that has um, you know, the particular attributes to it, and and he, the student eventually by analyzing many different sorts of rocks, okay, will be able to understand um, what it is that distinguishes rock from something that is not a rock, right? Um, and he'll be able to come to a more universal knowledge, um, you know, of what a rock is in general, okay? Now, this general, what a rock is, <laughs> it is um, not something material. It's not a particular rock that you can see or touch. Um, it's something intellectual. It's it, it, the uh, the further we remove all the um, what are called accidental attributes of of a particular rock we might be holding, and we can um, the closer we get to understanding 
what a rock is. Now, of course, there's mineralogists and you know, people who devote their entire careers to studying rocks, right? And geologists, and um, and so it's um, you know, there's always more to learn. <laughs> uh, it's the more the, the more we abstract away from you know material things, the more the more close we get to a deeper understanding of the the particular objects of the various sciences. Um, thesis 19, we therefore receive our knowledge from sensible things. Okay, so um, now the present state of, of when our body and soul are united together, um, we have to understand the essences of things um, by abstracting from their material conditions. Okay, so if you want to understand a dog, I'll give another example. Um, you know, dogs come in all sizes, shapes, and <laughs> um, colors, and fur lengths, and, you know, there's all these abstract material conditions that particular dogs have. But what is a dog in general, right? That's something that um, takes more effort um, on the part of the student and the teacher to understand, you know, what dogness is. Um, so although we get our knowledge from sensible things, um, uh, you know, the, the goal um, is toward something in intellectual, which is immaterial, okay? Um, so that's, those, those are kind of the main points that are important for um, pedagogy, okay? And it's like, for example, this one mentions phantasms, which are basically like mental images, okay? The importance of, you know, that that's how we learn, um, so if we can give the students abilities to, to form that in their, in their imaginations, um, they, they can get closer to, to this um, intellectuality, this immateriality of, of knowledge. Okay. And then in the last three theses are theodicy, which has to do with what we can say about God. Okay. So these 24... Thomistic theses form, I mean, there's commentators that have written entire books on explaining you know, these 24 theses in more detail, but these are the principles that um, that St. Thomas has given us, and they've just been um, um, consolidated down into these 24 brief, um, concise statements here. Um, okay, um, what else does St. Thomas have to say about uh, pedagogy? Um, so let me go back. You know, he said that Pope Pius XI said that he gives us the firm and enduring principles of each single science. Um, and he also explains the order in which, um, the different sciences should be taught. Um, and he does this in his commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, um, a, a work on ethics that Aristotle wrote. Um, and this is the section in that work on um, prudence. So it's interesting he classifies pedagogy under the, the virtue of prudence. The proper order of learning is that boys, you know, it's, it's and that's another important, interesting fact, he's talking about boys. Um, so young, young children okay, should be taught in this order. Okay? First, they should be instructed in things pertaining to logic because logic teaches the method of the whole of philosophy. Okay, so logic is that art, and it's also a science, but, it, but it's that art that helps us order our thoughts. Okay, now there's a lot um, of different subjects that help us order our thoughts, writing, reading, um, uh, you know, the, the basic grammar, grammar, uh, understanding grammar. Um, so this is what so St. Thomas himself, he was taught in, um, by Benedictine monks when he was about eight years old. They, they entrusted him with them. Um, and they taught you know, with the sort of classical curriculum of the trivium and quadrivium. Um, the trivium had to do with the rhetoric and um, you know, um, writing and, and reading. And you know, these, these teach, you, teach the students the logic skills. But even a formal logic class... Uh, can be taught to to children as well, so they can understand 
logical fallacies, understand basic syllogisms in a so all men are risible. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is risible. Right? And those basic um, logical syllogisms can be taught to children as well. Next, they should be taught mathematics. Okay, and he says this because you do not need much experience, much life experience in order to do mathematics. Okay. And also you don't need much imagination to do mathematics. Mathematics is very clear cut, right? Um, St. Thomas has a lot to say about, you know, our human intellects are are, are very, um, mathematics is co-natural to our human intellects. I mean, there's a lot, um, and you can get a lot of certitude in mathematics. Um, okay, and then third in the natural sciences. So, you know, what we would just say call sciences today, but the natural sciences that, that study like astronomy, physics, um, chemistry, you know, all the all the various different sciences that study changeable beings, you know, beings that change, um, for example, from liquid to solid form in chemistry, or um, okay. So even though the they don't exceed the sense and imagination. They do require some experience. You know, you need some real-world experience in order to to do the natural sciences. And after this, you need that he says to teach the moral sciences. Okay, so this is, has to do about human actions and, and you know what's what's good and what's bad. Um, you know, a soul free from from passions, because we need to, <laughs> to be more mature in order to study the moral sciences. And in, you know, in religion classes, the morality comes up as well. Um, so I don't think, you know, St. Thomas is saying that this is a sort of chronological order, um, but this is you know, how the different sciences build upon one or the other. Certainly you can teach morality to, to very young children, but, you know, it's more just telling them, you know, what to do, and you know, this is right, that's wrong, not really giving them any explanation behind it. Uh, okay, but m later when they're, when they mature, they're, they'll be able to actually do morality <laughs> and give valid reasons for why it's wrong to steal something, or um, why it's wrong to lie to your parents, or things like that. Um, and then last, um, the sapiential and divine sciences. Um, you know, these far exceed our imagination. You know, we can't picture what an angel is or what God is. Or, um, you know, we need a very, um, you know, these are, <laughs> these sciences, metaphysics and, and theology, they, you know, they're, they're far beyond our, our senses. Um, they're far beyond matter. Um, so, remember we talked about how intellectuality follows immateriality. The, the objects of these sciences are very are immaterial beings, angels and, and God. Right? So we need a very sharp intellect to to understand that. Um, so that's that's the order of the sciences. Okay. Saint Thomas also gives more reasons why. So he says we should study. You know, after we study logic and math. We should study the natural sciences. So why should we do that? So in, in a work that he wrote, it's called the Summa Contra Gentiles. The Gentiles are just um, unbelieving, the unbaptized people. He intended the audience of this work to be Muslims, he, um, to help convert Muslims. Um, in this work, it's more of a philosophical work because he, um, at least at the very beginning, doesn't mention... Uh, doesn't take many of his arguments from the authority of scripture. It's more about um, from common sense principles. He says, you know, he gives four reasons why we should do the natural sciences, why students should learn the natural sciences. Through meditating on his works, we are able somewhat to admire and consider the divine wisdom. Okay, so this is why we should study God's creation. Um, St. Paul in his first chapter to his letter to the Romans says you know, that we can understand 
even that God is divine um, based on um, the world around us. Okay. Studying the, the natural world leads us to admire the sublime power of God and consequently begets in men's hearts a reverence for God. Okay. So when we see, you know, the marvelous order of all of creation, how powerful it is, how um, grandiose it is, right? Um, we understand that you know, that God is even greater, right? So it, that, that makes us even more reverent, makes us understand how little we are. And, and okay. Studying the natural world inflames the souls of men to the love of the divine goodness. Okay. Because everything, everything good, a good ice cream cone or a good, um, you know, beautiful sunset or um, all this goodness comes from God, the source of all goodness. Okay. And it bestows on man a certain likeness to the divine perfection. Okay, so we can, by understanding the universe, now although we understand it much differently than God does. God understands the universe by contemplating himself. Okay, we have to understand it by using our bodies, um, by reasoning step by step with our, um, with our what's called ratio sensitive um, intellect. You know, it goes step by step, unlike the angels that can just intuitively understand things by, um, by their vision of God. You know, we have to use our bodies um, to gather data from our various senses, and um, and it's a lot of work, right? Uh, so this uh, makes us appreciate, you know, how great God is in His wisdom, you know, was in in ordering the universe in, in the way that He did. Okay, like at the, um, you know, Saint Thomas's prayer at the, okay, He did, He appointed three hierarchies of angels and set them in wondrous order over the highest heavens, and He apportioned the elements most wisely. When we study the, the various elements of the world, we see, you know, that he really did um, <laughs> make the weight of, you know, um, an apple just per, just the right way, you know, the size of a tree and, and you know, the um, distance that the sun is from the earth. He, he made exactly the, the proper way um, in all his wisdom so that it would all um, work together in, in harmonious order. Uh, okay. Um, oh, okay, this title is wrong. This should say, um, you know, why, um, how St. Tom, or how studying the natural world helps other people. Um, and it's that through ignorance of the nature of, of creatures, so there's a lot of ignorance of the nature of creatures today, uh, man is so far misled as to deem that which can bet derive its being from something else than the first cause and God, for they think that nothing exists besides visible creatures. Okay, so many people think that today, that that's all that there is. Okay. Um, but, you know, the more that you study creation, the more you realize that there has to be something um, that's beyond it. Okay, that's beyond the physical world. Okay, and that's why Aristotle called his work the metaphysics, which means like beyond the study of the natural world. So physics is the study of natural things, um, but there must be something beyond that that gives these natural things um, their being. Um, okay, So Pache, the, the Greek philosophers, you know, the universe didn't, hasn't existed forever. It's not eternal, but it requires a uh, a, a creator okay okay so the more we understand creatures the more we understand that they um, have very little being compared to um, the supreme being okay so creatures tend to, to decompose to fall apart even atoms decay you now heavier atoms decay into lighter atoms um, no, they, they don't have much permanence to them. Um, so there must be this eternal being that is responsible for their existence. Okay, we can't, <laughs> we don't depend on nothing. We do. Um, okay. Studying the natural world can 
help others um, because many people ascribe to certain creatures that which belongs to God alone. So this is the, basically the definition of superstition when you think that a, a creature has divine um, qualities. Um, and this follows from an error in the understanding of, of a creature. So people worshiping you know, graven statues. And St. Paul has <laughs> some um, mentions that, you know, how absurd it is to, to, uh, you know, to, to worship something that's just made by human hands. Uh, um, but we can, by understanding the natural world, help the people understand that there are certain things that only belong to God and certain things that only, prop, you know, certain powers that only belong um, that do not belong to creatures, but that only belong to God, right? Like there's no omnipotent or omniscient um, statue or <laughs> or computer today. People are thinking <laughs> artificial intelligence. So, um, uh, but but you know these things, omnipotence, omniscience. You know these belong to God alone, not to creatures. Third reason he gives is through ignorance of creatures' nature, something is withdrawn from the divine power and it's working on creatures. Okay, so if we think that there's more um, in creatures than than actually there is, um, then we're detracting from from the divine power, which is um, behind uh, all of creatures. Right, so creatures get their their being from the supreme being. They get their um, um, their power from from the power of God, right? They, it, it, they all depend upon God. So. Man who is led by faith to God as his last end through ignoring the natures of things and consequently the order of his place in the universe thinks himself to be beneath certain creatures above whom he is placed. Okay, so by not studying the natural world, we um, might be misled into thinking that um, you know, not really knowing our true place in the created universe. Right? Um, this error is very common today, you know, amongst animal rights activists or people who think that um, humans aren't, don't have much value and, uh, you know, they have, have the order of creation completely inverted. Man is the, the summit of all of the physical world, right? And he, his body, you know, our body has everything all the minerals the um we have attributes of us that are similar to plants attributes of us that are similar to the brute animals um and, and even attributes of us similar to the angels even though we're less than than angels um in the order of the universe in the order of creation okay so studying the physical world helps students to understand their pl true place in the universe uh, okay all right now kind of to Next part, so that's, those were some of the main pedagogical principles of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now I want to shift gears and go back all the way to St. Augustine. Um, we, I mentioned earlier he was probably the greatest theological influence on St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay, um, St. Augustine wrote a work called, uh, now there was many works even in the higher high middle ages the scholastics would commentate on um you know questions of w what does it mean to teach <laughs> how do teachers teach um saint augustine uh wrote a dialogue between him and his um and his illegitimate son um in 389 um called um just his de magistra and later in life, in St. Augustine's retractions, he summarized his De Magistro as a discussion and investigation and the discovery that there is no teacher who teaches man except God, according to what, in truth, is written in the Gospel. One is your teacher, or um, the Christ. Okay. So this work, um, so this on the teacher work that St. Augustine wrote, was intended to show that that Christ is the primary teacher. Christ is our teacher. Um, and you know, similarly, so that I mentioned 
he quotes Matthew 23.10. There's also a similar verse where Jesus says, you know, do not call anybody father, for one is your father in heaven. He says also, you know, do not call anybody teacher, um, for only one is your teacher. So we are only teachers in an analogous sense, um, just like fathers um, are only fathers in, a, in a, a sense analogous to the, the fatherhood of God. Um, so God is the supreme father. Um, human fathers get their fatherhood from God. It's similar with teaching. You know, God, um, Christ is the supreme teacher. We, we teachers um, get that title only from, from Christ. Uh, God is the supreme being, the unchangeable changer, um, or the, the primary mover, as he's also called. So he is responsible for all change that occurs. Um, now, the, going from a state of ignorance to a state of knowledge, um, which is what teaching does, it, it, it um, affects that change, um, is something ultimately dependent upon God, right? So, so without God, um, teaching would be impossible. Teaching wouldn't occur because there could be no change from a state of ignorance to a state of possessing knowledge. Okay. And so St. Augustine devised what um, the Thomistic semantician John Dealey um, described in his 2001 work, The Four Ages of Understanding, um, which is an excellent um, history of philosophy, that God alone and God in the person of Christ teaches the human being in such a way that knowledge results. Okay, so this is St. Augustine's illumination theory of knowledge, that God illuminates our intellect, um, and he actually produces knowledge. Okay. So you would think that if, if that happens, well then, why do we need human teachers? <laughs> right? um, if God just illuminates uh, the intellect of everybody that um, obtains knowledge, um, then are teachers, are human teachers really necessary? Okay. Um, St. Thomas will, in his De Magistro, um, disputation, which he wrote between 1256 and 1259 when he was teaching at the University of Paris. So this is a picture, illustration here showing him teaching. Um, they would do what are called scholastic disputations, which were basically debates where various questions were presented and you know, um, objections were given. Um, you know, St. Thomas or whoever was giving the disputation would give his own opinion, and then um, the objections would be addressed. Um, and so St. Thomas did a disputation in his um, disputed questions on truth, question number 11. So this is where he talks about teaching. Um, and he ad asks four questions. Can a man or only God teach and be called teacher? Okay. Can one be called his own teacher? Which is interesting. Okay. Can a man be taught by an angel? Okay. Um, so, you know, do we really need teachers? Can't just God or angels teach? Um, and is teaching an activity of the contemplative or the active life? Okay, so there's religious orders like the Carmelites that are devoted to just pure contemplation. There's active religious orders like the missionary orders. Um, and then there's mixed orders like the Dominicans that are a um, combination of contemplation and activity. Um, and that's how St. Thomas will answer that question. Um, teaching is a, an activity both. You, know, you need to contemplate um, and then share with others the fruit of your contemplation. So that would that sharing with others would be the active part, and then that you know the co contemplative part, where he would um, think about things and you know it's kind of his lesson planning that he would do uh, was was more of the the contemplative side of teaching. Okay. Um, so before we go into addressing that, we're going to focus just on this question up here: Can a man or only be God teach and be called a teacher. Um, before we 
address that question, I want to talk about a commentator on um, St. Thomas Aquinas, who is a, a Dominican theologian from Portugal, um, from, uh, John of St. Thomas, okay, also known as Jean Ponceau. Okay, Ponceau um, was famous, probably one of the most famous commentators on the works of um, St. Thomas Aquinas. There's some other ones, Cardinal Cajetan, who was a master general of the Dominican order, who was entrusted with trying to convert, bring Luther back to the Catholic faith, um, was another famous commentator on St. Thomas Aquinas. But um, John Ponceau um, now took as his religious name John of St. Thomas. I mean, he, he wanted, you know, he saw himself as, as a, um, you know, a really great, you know, as a devoted disciple of the angelic doctor. Um, and he did, John of St. Thomas devised a whole theory of, of signs. Um, so he was contempor he lived contemporaneously with Descartes and, and Galileo. And, um, and his uh, philosophy, um, his whole semiotics or study of signs kind of got buried. Um, and it wasn't until the Thomistic uh, philosopher John um, Dealey that his work w was made more known. So John Dealey in 1985 translated um, the treatise on signs of John of St. Thomas and, and really promoted John of St. Thomas's semiotics. Jacques Maritain, another Catholic um, philosopher, was also another um, uh, proponent of John of St. Thomas. Um, and John of St. Thomas defines a sign as that which represents something other than itself to a cognitive power. Okay, so this is very precise definition. Okay, that which, some, which represents something other than itself. Okay, so a sign is something that points to something else. Okay, but it doesn't just point to it. It it points it um, in such a way that it becomes apparent to a cognitive power, to to an intellect. Okay, um, and so I've mentioned from his treatise on signs here. I, I put kind of this little Venn diagram of things that signify, things that represent, and things that make known. So signs um, point to things that represent. Okay, and things that represent help make thing make something known. Okay, so I have this picture of John of St. Thomas here, right? This is an, an image of him. We could say it's a representation of him, right? So it's presenting John of St. Thomas to us, and in that way it makes him known to our cognitive power. Right? Okay. I wouldn't really call this image a sign. Because the image is not representing um, something; it's not representing something other than itself. I mean, the image is the image of John of Saint Thomas. It's not pointing to something else. Okay. Okay. So keep that in mind because we're going to talk about how how signs are used in teaching. Okay. okay. So teaching involves. The usage of signs, so I'm showing a picture here of St. Albert the Great and St. Thomas, his, his student here. Okay. So St. Thomas in his De Magistro says, A man teaches only through certain signs. Okay. So only through certain signs. So that's all we can do. Okay. Is, you know, we use signs, we point to something. Even if one seems to teach by means of things, as when asked what walking is, he walks, this is not sufficient to teach the one who asks, unless some sign be added, as Augustine proves in his De Magistro. Okay, so he gives this example of, now how do you explain to somebody, how do you teach somebody what it is to walk? Okay, well, you can just start walking, right? Well, what what if your student thinks that um, <laughs> sees you walking and just doesn't understand what you're trying to what what you're trying to say? Okay, you say okay. Well, I'm trying to understand walking. Well, this is what walking is, 
and you start walking. Maybe he, he thinks you're falling. <laughs> Maybe he thinks walking is a series of interrupted falls <laughs> or something, right? Um, so you have to add some sign to this. You know, you, you have to say, you have to point to it and say, you know, this is walking. Okay, you, um, you have to, to use some sign. Okay. And not just one sign, but probably many signs you have to use in order to um, really explain what, for example, walking is. <laughs> okay. He does this by showing that there are many factors involved in the same action. Okay, so he distinguishes. You know, you have to distinguish from from falling and walking, and from uh, running and and walking. You know, the example Saint Augustine gives. Well, maybe the teacher, if he wants to draw attention to him walking, he'll start walking faster. Well, um, you know, that's probably going to confuse the students because that looks like running, right? So you have to use signs in order to um, to really show. You know. There's, there's a lot involved in, in walking, slowness, um, movement of legs, change of place, you know, what place even is. Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, to truly explain what walking is um, um, would take a lot of work, right? And we have to use a lot of signs in order to do that. The knowledge of signs is directed to knowledge of things as means to an end, okay? So like in this... Signs are the things that signify, point to things that represent and, and make known. Okay, so we're leading. So we're, it's interesting that St. Thomas is showing that teachers are really facilitators in the student's knowledge. They're not the, the um, you know, what we'll say is proximate efficient cause of the student's knowledge. I mean, they're, um, they're an instrumental cause of God's effecting the change from ignorance to knowledge. Okay, so that's exactly what he says here. Okay, signs are not the proximate efficient cause of knowledge, but reason is in its passage from principles to conclusions. Okay, so signs which the teachers use are not the, um, the primary cause of the student's knowledge. Okay, the student has to reason through things himself with the, you know, the help of the intellectual light that God has given into his intellect, into the student's intellect. All right. um, the student starts with principles, you know, very basic principles, um, like um, maybe what place is, what fast is, what slow is, things like this, and is able to reason to conclusions um, and to really learn what, say walking means all right um so students always start from you know you always have to progress from what is more known to what is lesser known so aristotle will say this in his um, posterior analytics and in his physics he mentions this too um we have to start from I mean, the students have to start from what is more known to them okay and usually things that are um close to their senses sight touch smell hearing all that is very known, uh, more known to them, and so that's why the uh, things that they can see or touch or you know that that's good to start there, um, and then we can work toward uh, more abstract or more intellectual things. Uh, okay, so students start from clear principles and they work to toward conclusions, and signs help point them toward. Um, you know, in the correct direction. Okay. okay. So how do the teacher's words produce knowledge in the student? So words are a particular type of sign that the teacher can use. Right? Um, how do they actually produce knowledge in the student? The words of the teacher are more proximate to the causing of knowledge than are the sensible things independent of the mind, insofar as words are the signs of intelligible intentions. Okay. So more proximate to the causing of knowledge than the sensible things independent of the mind. So this shows you know, how close the words of a teacher are to um, affecting knowledge in the student. I mean, a lecture the lecture format is not something to be frowned upon. Um, 
Um, no teachers, I mean, the lecture format was used in the medieval universities, used, um, it's a time-tested um, teaching technique, and because it's because these words um, are so um, proximate to the cause of, know of the knowing in the students, um, even more so than, you know, what they can then sense um, with their senses. Okay, so words really help get the students toward um, that immaterial intellectual knowledge. Words cause knowledge insofar as they are signs, not by representing objectively, but by leading, deducendo, to the thing signified. Okay, so this is what John of St. Thomas says um, after he quotes uh, from St. Thomas here. Um, okay? So words do not represent something, or signs, you know, words, or, um, a particular, which are a particular type of sign, do not represent things objectively, but they lead to what the sign is pointing to, to what the sign is signifying. And I put the, the Latin deducendo, and that's where, it's where we get the word education from which means a drawing out or a leading, right? We lead, um, we use signs to, to lead or to point toward um, what we want the, the students to know. What, um, okay? Okay. Um, so that was uh, how teaching involves signs and, and how John of St. Thomas explained how words um, and how signs help to produce knowledge, okay. Charles Sanders Peirce um, was, um, he never read John of St. Thomas um, explicitly. He was, uh, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce was actually a Kantian before he read um, Don Scotus, that Franciscan um, philosopher. And he really started, um, <laughs> converting away from the philosophy of idealism um, more um, toward realism. Um, he um, noted that um, St. Thomas Aquinas was, it was probably devised the greatest uh, philosophical s structure <laughs> of any philosopher. So he, he had a respect for um, John of, uh, of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, Peirce was a teacher of John Dewey, interestingly, and, and James as well. And they, you know, Dewey and James uh, formed the um, pragmatism movement. Um, you know, the basically only the practical things are what really matter to, in philosophy. Um, Peirce distanced himself from that movement, um, coining the term pragmatism um, to distinguish from his students. Um, pragmatism okay so purse is more of a realist um, he's not an idealist um, philosophically um, he devised one of the the greatest um, classifications of the different types of signs so this is why today he's known as a semiotician okay um, so not just words like Saussure and, and other philosophers think are signs, um, <laughs> but even um, material things in the natural world can be signs. For example, smoke um, can be a sign of fire, right? Um, dark clouds could be a sign of a, a thunderstorm, etc. Um, you know, this is the sense that signs were used in 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 medicine in the the ancient Greeks, um, like the color of urine, um, was considered a, a, a common sign of as to what the health of the person was in in medicine. So there's more to to signs than words. Okay, um, and Peirce understood that, and he developed a whole philosophy around the action of signs. Okay, so signs play an active role in our no knowledge and in in the universe and too in the physical world signs are operating like birds 
um, use signs, right? Even though they don't understand, they don't have the intellect to know what a sign is, they still use signs, right? Um, and the different sort of chirps they make and calls they, they produce. Um, and so Peirce develop, uh, coined this term semiosis to mean the action of signs, okay? So there's this, um, this constant process of semiosis, you know, one sign signifying another, signifying another, um, and this, um, uh, um, St. Augustine was considered a proto-semiotician proto in his De Magistro work and also in his De Doctrina Christiana, where it's more of a work on um, exegesis, how to interpret Holy Scripture. Um, uh, he was one of the first semioticians, but now Peirce has really brought semiotics to um, a, a mature science, a mature uh, philosophy. Um, Peirce also developed a classification of the sciences as well. We saw St. Thomas's ordering of the sciences. Um, Peirce has an even more in-depth classification of, of the sciences and how they relate to one another. Um, so he's not very well known. There's um, a university in, in Texas, in, in Lubbock, Texas, um, that has a, a purse studies department. Um, uh, so there are some philosophers, but he's not as well known as he should be. Um, you know, he's, he's certainly one of the, he's probably the greatest philosopher and logician as well. He came up with multi-value multi logics, and, um, and he was quite a a polymath. He, he actually worked as a, a surveyor and then he taught at um, Johns Hopkins and, and Harvard and you know, he gave lectures there. Um, very interesting um, life and, and philosoph philosophical uh, conversion story. You know, he, he became very anti-Kantian after um, having discovered um, SCOTUS. Um, and he essentially thought that all of philosophy from Descartes up to the up to his time was nominalism, which is <laughs> um, opposed to realism. Nominalism basically says things are what we call them, right? Um, that um, there's really no essences of things in in the real world. They're just you know what we make them to be, <laughs> um, is what nominalism says. So that. Uh, um, that's basically a form of idealism, um, you know, um, disconnects our mind from, from the real world. Um, so it's interesting, he taught John Dewey, um, uh, but John Dewey was more of an idealist than, than his teacher Peirce. Um, you know, that's why Peirce <laughs> wanted to distinguish his philosophy of pragmatism from, from the pragmatism of Dewey and, and others. Okay. Um, there's a whole return now to, um, I mean, there's the, a whole flourishing of <laughs> semiotics. Um, so I mentioned John Dealey in 1985, translating John of St. Thomas's um, treatise on signs. Um, and also um, other philosophers, like you might have heard of Umberto Eco, um, was a great linguist and semiotician. Um, Sebiak is another great semiotician. Um, there's a whole explosion since then of these various fields of semiotics. There's physiosemiotics, you know, how signs, the action of signs in the um, physiological world, you know, in animals and in plants. And um, and now um, there's this branch of semiotics called edusemiotics. Okay, edusemiotics is a pioneering area of study that connects semiotics, the science of signs, with educational theory and the philosophy of education. It's a novel, unified conceptual framework at the interface of theoretical semiotics and educational philosophy. Okay, John Dealey writes an article in this um, handbook, Edgy Semiotics handbook that was um, published in 2017. Ina um, Semetsky is probably the, the leading, um, the current leader in this branch of semiotics. 
Um, and so she edited, edited this handbook. Um, the article in it, or her introduction, and then um, the first article by John Dealey are, are the two um, really good articles to read um, because Dealey has a, um, a solid foundation in, in Thomistic um, philosophy. Um, Dealey actually studied in the St. Albert the Great um, Institute in River Forest, um, which is west of Chicago. Um, so he was on the track to becoming a, a Dominican. Um, he eventually left the Dominican order, and I think that's when Maritain told him to to translate John of St. Thomas, and you know, he really um, got his career going um, with semiotics. Dealey is also a, um, an expert in Heidegger, um, and, and I mentioned earlier, Dealey wrote that, um, Four Ages of Understanding, which um, shows how philosophy developed from a semiotics perspective from the time of St. Augustine up through you know, Descartes, up to you know, um, Charles Sanders Peirce. Okay. So there's a lot, a lot to study about <laughs> what signs are, how teachers can more effectively use signs um, in order to um, lead the students toward you know, what the signs signify. Um, you know, the, the better we can develop, um, and we use signs all the time, whether they be diagrams. Um, you know, John, um, Charles Sanders Peirce was very uh, a, a huge proponent in um, diagramic thinking. I mean, even his logic, um, his logical proofs, and um, and the sort of logic he devised re um, relied on these very elaborate diagrams, um, notation. And he devised a whole notation of diagrams to. Um, he had a whole graphical theory <laughs> of logic. So he mentioned the importance of diagrams for understanding. This is something that's. Um, um, that many um, pedagogists have <laughs> have um, have stressed, um, or you know, how do we use other sorts of signs in our teaching process? So, so graphical diagrams certainly that's that's one of them. Um, but the more effectively that we can come up with a sign, the better that it'll point to, um, you know, to to that knowledge that we are um, intending it to signify. Okay, all right. So that's uh, the end of my my talk. Um, these are all the references. Um, I really look forward to um, teaching more people about the educational philosophy of John uh, of Saint Thomas Aquinas and his commentators, as well as um, studying more how signs can be used to help in the process of producing knowledge in our students. All right, thank you. Bye.